happening, what's happening, what's happening, blues peoples. You are yet again tuned in, listening to and watching Jack Dapper Blues Heritage Podcast recorded right here at Brick Media Arts Center in Brooklyn, New York. Now, I'm here with my main man, Derek Johnson, K.A., Brooklyn Blues, who's NGN with no mic. What's going on, man? Everything is okay. We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to figure, you got to ask some questions. All right. Now, I'm with my guest of today. Okay, the funny story. I met this gentleman in improv class at Upright Citizens Brigade, better known as UCB. They have moved the center location, and they are currently moving the theater. They have a second theater in uh, Alphabet City. And this guy, we was talking about this off the air. Peter Benjaminson. He, he, I, I, I've never come across an improvist. Is that how you would say it? An improvist? Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> with, with, with the, the pop culture uh, historical knowledge uh, as well as book knowledge and just regular common sense that knew how to utilize this in extremely uh, uncomfortable and weird situations and make it very funny. <laughs> Thanks. So we want to talk about his books. The first book, as you can see, I'm holding Mary Wells, The Tumultuous, is that what it says? Tumultuous. Tumultuous. Now I just told the entire world that I'm illiterate. <laughs> the tumultuous life of Motown's first superstar. Honestly, we, we didn't laugh at him in improv. He could read that. That's okay. <laughs> and not to mention, you were on the unsung about Mary Wells. Yes, that's right. Right? One of my most favorite of them all. Rick James, bitch. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Super Freak, The Life of Rick James. Also, another favorite of mine, uh, kind of reminds me of my wife. The Law Supreme, The Life of Dream Girl Florence Ballard, who actually sings great. She got the blues and the spirituals in her. To me, she's like the female version of David Ruffin. And then we have the story of Motown, okay? So we want to talk about these books, his inspiration behind covering African American tribal musics, along with the black experience, because you have no music if you have no experience. You have no experience if you have no people, and from the people come the traditions, the heritage, and the culture. So let's give a warm Jack Dapper Blues welcome to Peter Benjaminson. What's happening? Oh, lots happening, and thank you for allowing me to be on your show. It's a great privilege, and it's great seeing you. Uh, months or maybe even a year after, yeah. after the last improv <laughs> performance that we did together. That's right. Uh, we both uh, elicited a great deal of applause. Uh, some of it may have just been trying to tell us to shut up, but the rest of it was probably uh, an earned applause. Yes, uh, I, I, it's good to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know which one to start. You know what? I want to start with uh, Mary Wells. Okay. Okay, for the simple fact that I believe at the time we were doing improv, it was, uh, a lot of people were talking about it. Either way, I know I just recently, yet again, saw the um, unsung episode of Mary Wells, and it, it's just a very it's an interesting story on so many levels in regards to her being the first breakout uh, record of Motown, meaning crossover, right? So now what was interesting, for, okay, first I'm gonna ask you about this, then I wanna go into your journey actually, okay. how we got to this point. But what was for you interesting and, and called you to write her story? Well, that's that's interesting because I actually, it's an interesting question because I actually got a call about it. Let me, let me uh, quickly go back over the other books because they'll set the foundation for a couple of the other books. Okay. Uh, I was a reporter for the Detroit Free Press in, uh, I know I look about 25, but actually I was a reporter for the Detroit Free Press in ninth, from 1970 to 76. And uh, I uh, had written a book with a friend of mine, Dave Anderson, uh, it was called Investigative Reporting. It was the first how-to book on how to do investigative reporting. Oh, wow. And that, that was a big success. 
it was uh, it was in print for 20 years. It went through two editions. Uh, there was Woodward and Bernstein had recently uh, expelled Nixon from office, so everyone was interested in investigative reporting. Right. We said we went to the library to look up a book on investigative reporting so we could learn how to do it. <laughs> well, we realized there wasn't one. Wow. Uh, we figured we've done some of this stuff. We'll write it. So we did. That was a big success. Then I really liked the book business because mostly because the big the book was a big success. So uh, I was looking around for another book to do, and just about that time, uh, your pal Flo Ballard. Mm. Uh, was got into trouble. She had right. been uh, released, fired from Motown, uh, from the Motown Record Company, and uh, we heard. I, I was a reporter, and I heard a tip that she was on welfare, which at the time in Detroit was amazing. It was like uh, I don't know a story now that Ivanka Trump is on welfare. Right. You know, people were right. running around. What? what? <laughs> yeah. how, how is this Supreme? You know, because they also took, the Supremes kind of took the uh, Motown business to the next level. So it would be like, yes. how, did, how is this lady on or on welfare from that? That's what you mean, Exactly right, right. yes. So uh, I found out where she lived. It wasn't far from where I lived. We both lived in the city of Detroit. So I went over there, I uh, interviewed her, uh, and I did a story about her being on welfare, which broke that story. Uh, she she loved the story because I treated it sympathetically. I mean, as it turned out, I was right to take that approach because uh, what happened, I can go into it in more detail later, but what happened was that uh, Motown had paid her less than they should have, but when they did give her the several hundred, tried to give her the several hundred thousand dollars that they did owe her, her lawyer then stole it. Mm. Uh, and was he was later disbarred, now he's dead, but... Uh, it was a great story about a real musical star being screwed in the worst possible way, yes. financially, actually. So, uh, Amongst other things, I mean, she, she really got a bad end of the stick, and she was instrumental in bringing those young ladies together, right? Yes, she did bring them together. Uh, they were the most successful female pop group of all time. Uh, black, white, anybody. Uh, they, they did the best that they could, which was the best in the business, and sh they were the... Uh, the most successful uh, female vocal group that Motown ever fielded. So yes, she brought them together. She should have been treated a lot better. She was treated badly instead. Anyway, I then tried to sell that book, uh, that the idea of that book, to a publisher. Uh, I went to Grove Press in New York, and uh, which was a big time uh, organization then. It was known for its uh, for putting out books that were controversial. Right, uh, and they said. You know, we'd love to put out this book, but there's never been a book written about the Motown Record Company. This was in 1976. Mm. They had been a uh, major force in music since 1959. Right. So I was a surprise. I was very surprised to learn that. I hadn't even thought about doing it. So I. Uh, they said, "Why don't you write a book about Motown?" So I wrote the first book ever published about the Motown Record wow. Company. <coughs> and now, at this time. Motown's music was, now let me put this in context, considering their humongous success of the late 50s and throughout the 60s, their music was somewhat simmering to a degree, because I think at this time the Jacksons left, right, 76, but their film, the, the film part of their business was actually flourishing at this time, Yes, right? you're absolutely right. No, they, they really hit it big in the mid-60s. Then they started a very long decline from the mid-60s uh, into the 80s when they were finally sold. But yes, in the late 70s, they were doing Lady Sings the Blues, right. a very successful film about Billie Holiday, which starred Diana Ross. Then they did a couple of other movies, uh, which were also very good, uh, but not as good as Lady Sings the Blues. They didn't do as well in the film business as they'd done in the record business. Right. But I was astonished. I mean, I couldn't... There are a lot of holes in book publishing. You know, if you want to do a, a non-fiction book, you can always find a place where there's no book on something. Mm. And then, of course, there's no competition when you write it. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so timing was everything. Yeah, right. So I wrote this one. Uh, that did very well. Then... Uh, I, did, I kept trying to sell the Flo Ballard book, uh, and I wrote several other several other books, but they were all about journalism. Okay. Uh, 
I went back to the idea of writing books about investigative reporting. Uh, I wrote one about called Death in the Afternoon, mm. about the death of afternoon newspapers in America. Then I wrote one about uh, uh, how to get published if you're an author, and a couple of other books, one about the New York City Department of Investigation called Secret Police. Uh, I love great titles. Of course. <laughs> so uh, then finally, uh, I was able to sell uh, the idea uh, of a book on Flo Ballard. To, uh, now, how long ago, how long was this from the time you first started? Because you mentioned a lot of books, so we're talking uh, a nice 10 year period. Well, we're talking a horrible 40 year period. Wow. From 77, when I started trying to sell it, to 2007, which is when it came out. Wow, okay. So. I, I have a question on this. Uh, 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 two questions. First question is do you believe it took that long to get someone to press this or distribute it because of the hold Motown, Barry Gordon, everybody had on Flo's story? And the second question is, how come she's not in this picture? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, probably, I, I tried, I was the one who was supposed to get these pictures, and that has Sydney, Sydney Birdsong rather than Flo Ballard in it. Right. Uh, they were one of the Supreme groups. At that time, I couldn't find a picture of the Supremes with Flo Ballard in it that I could get permission to run. Mm. You got to remember, this was before the internet. Uh, right. I had the, the only way you could get pictures that I knew of, I was living uh, in Atlanta at the time, was to go around to record stores and see what pictures they had. I mean, how else would you do it? It's right, really absolutely. weird. Uh, there was no picture collection at the library, so, and there was no way to find out who had the pictures, because so, there were no books about Motown. It's like, right. <laughs> it's like you wander into a desert where no one's been. Where's the gold? You know? Right, exactly. And I, I believe, well, no, I don't believe, I asked that question because based on the picture not having flow. This is about seventy six, seventy seven, and and the 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 um, harsh terrain of trying to find these images because, like you just explained, the accessibility wasn't there, and then the amount of time it took to to have an agreement for this book to be published. Could that be the hold that was on her name? Because when her like um, Mary Wells, if I'm not mistaken. When they left Motown, they had to leave their names and image and everything, right? Yes, that was one of the ways that Motown treated Flo unfairly. They, they said she could leave and they'd give her the money they owed her, but she, they asked her and forced her to sign a contract saying she couldn't use the word supreme in connection with the rest of her career, which uh, really did her future career or a lot of harm Horrible. because if she could have advertised herself as former supreme Flo Ballard even now it would help uh, at that that time it would have made her uh, post Motown career a great one it would staple her, which which is odd and it's I guess it's kind of easy to do that in, in regards to though we know she was instrumental in bringing them together and to my personal opinion had the best voice and that's also based on what resonates to me because she sounds just like you know the, the classic black spirituals or blues you know the belting but because she wasn't in the forefront people just knew her face when, when the, her albums released post Motown did no one recognize this name yes you're absolutely right and you're right to emphasize the fact she had a traditional black voice very deep uh, country. country blues voice. Uh, I think, and a lot of other people think, she would have been very successful as the lead of the Supremes. Uh, there was a big fight between her and Diana Ross, who was thinner and had a reedy voice. In fact, uh, people laughed at, <clears throat> at Diana because it sounded like she was singing through her nose. <laughs> people, people would stand in the studio and go, oh my God, what's she doing? This is, this is going to screw us up. Uh, Gordy liked her. Uh, they had a romance, but I don't think that had much to do with it. She had romances with several people. So did he, obviously. <laughs> uh, he just he thought that her voice would stand out. I'm talking about Barry Gordy. Right, uh, right. Who's now in his late 80s, by the way. Yeah, well, you know, no one is, is disregarding uh, Barry's contribution to the music business. But it's, I, I, 
Well, I guess let me ask you like this. Do you believe he made that decision because of his his goal of crossover success? Because you can hear from all of every each and every uh, Motown artist, they just was... It's like a given. We're going to be... Excuse me, let me turn this off. Um, it's a given. They just knew, well, we're going to be played in local radio stations and around Detroit. They didn't anticipate this commercial success. Yes. Uh, he was... Well, what you're talking about is the concept of crossover. Uh, he was trying to... Uh, Gordy was trying to cross over to the white record market. Uh, not for any racist reason, obviously, but because it was big. For the money. That's right. That's where the money was. Right. Come on. That was the big post-war development. The teenagers got more and more money in their money in their pockets, and they were able and desirous of purchasing a lot, purchasing a lot of records. So, yeah, he wanted a wider sound, and he thought Diana provided it, uh, which she did. That's true. However, Flo could have been an equally popular singer if she hadn't been cheated by her lawyer uh, and if Motown had allowed her to keep the name Supreme attached to her own name. So, but it was a great story. This is, this is a very successful book. Uh, it's been optioned for the movie several times, but the movie has not yet come out. But that doesn't prove anything because the my attempt that I, thousands of other authors attempt to get their books made into movies run up against a tremendous number of hurdles. One of the big ones is, of course, the obvious one, that you need hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of dollars to Absolutely. make a movie. A book you can produce for, I don't know, a few thousand, uh, okay. which was uh, much easier to get, obviously. Well, I, I, w I will say, um, being blessed on this journey, I was able to meet people like David Ruffin Jr. and his mother. Um, She's going to kill me if I don't say her name, but <laughs> Mrs. Ruffin, um, but, but she, she has a book out. Now, the reason why I'm bringing her up is because her, is she, she, she makes it clear, and her, Gina Ruffins, okay, OG Gina, how you doing, sis? Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Um, she firmly and strongly suggests that the Motown elite uh, prevent the actual real stories of, of those who have fell victim to the Motown chopping block. Do you think that's part of the narrative of not being able to, to take it to the next step? I don't know. To, it's the answer. Everyone in business and otherwise tries to keep uh, negative stories away oh. from the public. Oh, away from the public. Okay. Uh, so... I don't know that they're any better or worse than, say, Exxon or uh, uh, right. anybody, the post office, you, you name it, any oh, big organization. Oil spill. Right, yes, that's right. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, they they haven't been successful in my case, and I'm not sure they were. I'm not sure they they caused the delay. It was probably. Uh, I have no idea. I, I I can't answer your question except that no one ever approached me negatively directly about it. So. Right. So, so like a tinted window car didn't pull up and say, "Hey, get it, get it." <laughs> no, nothing like that. Uh, actually, I saw a cartoon in a magazine yesterday. It showed a, a guy, two guys at a bar. One of them looked like a lumberjack. The other one looked like a gangster. And the gangster says to the lumberjack, "If a tree falls in the forest on a certain individual." Will he be able to testify in court? It was, I thought it was pretty good. Anyway. Uh, well, let me ask you this, because I, I obviously was not able to meet Miss Florence Ballard. What was she like as a person outside of what she's been portrayed to be like? Well, let me let me mention first that I met her in 75, and, and then she died in 76 at age 32. That's very young. Well, yeah. Uh, so she hadn't had a chance to, live. well, live. Well, she, her life is only a, approximately halfway through. But uh, she was very, uh, very calm, slightly depressed because by that time, she was relatively poor and certainly wasn't as rich as a Supreme should be. I mean, she, at that point, she had a house and had two kids. Her husband had left, and her he fame took was some gone. Money too, right? Uh, instrumental in. Yeah, to some extent. Uh, 
let me let me think it's so complicated i, I ought to refer people to the book which seems Absolutely. seems like i'm cheating but that's what the book is about. <laughs> uh, yes he's he's also dead now uh he didn't do very well by her and uh her lawyer certainly didn't do very well by her neither did motown so but she was very calm and reserved and intelligent i and a very good hostess i thought she was uh i was much impressed that she was still holding it all together you know it's amazing you go up in life from i mean she wasn't uh, her parents wasn't that poor but they were working class and then she goes rockets to the tops in a couple of years performing for queen elizabeth you know getting chased by mobs of fans and then rockets down and dies po in poverty stricken on welfare at age 32. Jeez. it's like very few people have that experience the, yeah I, I mean that that's uh shakespeare at his best, well, better, exactly. yeah, because <laughs> it's real. Master, yeah, you know. Um, I, I, I want to move to the side for a minute because of based on the situations that actually tried to beat up on 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 Miss Ballard, the lawyer, the record label, and all of the above, and you are having a tenure in investigative journalism. The first question would be, is, was her lawyers, lawyers of Motown, and do you find that a lot of times when things like this happen, similar to the 360 deal, the lawyers of the artists are, are um, company lawyers or, 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 or in cahoots with the company or, or solicited by the company rather than the actual artist getting an outside lawyer? That was Motown, what you're referring to is Motown's big trick mm. uh, they'd sign up people the uh, uh, they'd sign up people who are inexperienced in the music business then they'd assign them lawyers but the lawyers were paid and on the payroll and under the control of Motown so they did what was best for Motown obviously not what was best for the entertainer uh, some Motown artists realized this after they'd been at the company a few years when they're cut what they did was when their contracts came up for renewal they said uh we'll renew our contract but i want my own lawyer i'm going to hire him or her my i want my own agent you. i'm going to hire him or her and i want more money you know and so for a successful artist they could do that michael jackson did that for instance and uh, became extremely wealthy and was certainly not mistreated by motown after his initial stay there right and i'm talking only about financial mistreatment right 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 so uh, didn't david ruffins do that as well i you know more about it than i do perhaps but i think okay. so well I, well he david ruffins is, is like the equivalent of sun house to me he's a a, a legend of, of of black voice and um, one of the first people that I actually did full, and I hate to use this term, scholarly and academic research. Oh, know. go for it. <laughs> well, I, you know, but either way, just in, in regards of his voice and everything. But, um, yeah, okay, so, yeah. Now. But you were, let me answer your first question, because I postponed the answer. Oh, okay. You then asked, why did I think of doing Mary Wells after? Right, that's what I was about to oh, get okay. to. Okay. Uh, the reason is because after the Law Supreme came up, I got a call from a guy, uh, an elementary school teacher in Florida who I'd never met. He somehow got my phone number, and he said, "Look, you got to do a, got to do a book on Mary Wells." And uh, I said, "Why? Come on!" I gave him a hard time. I said, "Look, I just did one on Flo Ballard. Uh, if I do a book on Mary Wells, they." They knew each other. They were the same age. They worked for the same company. They lived near each other. They had the same friends. Their careers are very similar. <laughs> People will laugh at me. He just changed the name on this first book on <laughs> the Mary Lost Supreme Book. <laughs> Why doesn't the guy get something he could actually? He actually has the work to do. So uh, this guy, he kept kept calling me back and telling me about the differences between Flo's career and Mary Wells's career, and they were so astounding. Uh, and yeah. Mary Wells was such an interesting person. He finally convinced me. Uh, so, 
Uh, I then wrote the book about Mary Wells, which uh, is still is almost as successful as The Lost Supreme. It got a, uh, I hate the boast. Actually, I love the boast. boast. I love the boast. Uh, it got a full page review in the Wall Street Journal. Oh, wow. Which at the time was the nation's, and still is, I think, the nation's largest circulation newspaper. Yeah, um, that's something to boast about, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't even know the reviewer. So I was, I was very pleased. You know, I was pleased. It was, it was a straight right, it was, it was, it, You did not have to lie before it, like right. we're finding out about so many other things. Right, exactly. Okay, so somebody had to hunt you down to do Mary Wells' story. Yeah. Okay, now, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm wording it that way is because for the most part, well, not for the most yeah, for the most part, people don't understand the uniqueness and everything that goes behind her entire life. And we just think she was just this young lady who was in the right place at the right time. But there was a lot of things that transpired to get her to that place and a lot of things afterward that got her to uh, not even an untimely demise, but her 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 comeback, you know, that was not necessarily shaky, I don't want to say shaky, but just different experiences in her life that people aren't aware of yes. that makes the story. I know exactly what you're referring to. Well, one, of the, one of the things that struck me about all the Motown people, uh, certainly the ladies, the women, were how young they started. I mean, both, Mo, uh, both Mary and Flo uh, were too young to even sign contracts when they signed up. Uh, their mothers had to come down and sign it for them because under Michigan law you couldn't sign a contract if you were 16 or 17 right. or whatever they were. You had to be 18. Their mothers signed the contracts uh, and with Mary, unlike Flo and the Supremes, they were known as the no-hit Supremes for several years. Right. Uh, they produced record after record. They were okay, but they weren't hits. Mary, uh, she said at one point, she told one of her boyfriends that she was going to go into her closet, her secret closet, and write a, a song that would be a hit. Uh, she obviously met her spiritual closet. Oh, of course. You know? And uh, she went in there and uh, wrote a song uh, called Bye Bye Baby. She wrote it herself. She had no musical training. She just picked up things. Uh, she graduated from high school, signed up with Motown, or she, excuse me, she graduated from high school, wrote this song, then went to see Gordy, who was at a nightclub, the 20 grand. He was, he had two acts in different parts of this large nightclub. He was moving back and forth, trying to make sure everything was okay with the two acts. He did, she didn't know him, she just uh, accosted him in the hall and said, Mr. Gordy, Mr. Gordy, I've got this song I want to sing you. He said, not now, not now, not now, not now. Finally, she kept up with him. He said, okay, sing it. Just sing it right now. <laughs> sing it out. So she stood there with no instrument. Oh, wow. Company, oh. Just sang it a cappella in front of him. Bye-bye, wow. baby. He wow. says, okay, come into the office tomorrow. She did. She brought her mother. He said, bring your mother to Of course. He, she brought her mother. They signed up. The song was a hit. It, it's an amazing beginning. This was, she must have been, she was less than, less than 18, probably right. 17. Uh, and, and somewhat of an adult from a young age based on yeah. her upbringing, right? Yeah. Unlike some of the, the other, um, other uh, unlike Flo and some of the other young ladies, she was actually uh, uh, somewhat of, uh, not an old spirit, but had the responsibility of an adult at a young age. Yes, right? she absolutely did. She, uh, Gordy, uh, let her have all the money, as he was legally required to. He let her have all the money she was due under her contract for the song, which was a, uh, a very good, it wasn't the top 10 hit, but it was certainly in the top 100, maybe even in the top 20. I can look it up in my own book, I just can't remember. But uh, she uh, <laughs> she then started supporting her mother, uh, who was a, who worked as a domestic cleaner. Right. Uh, and uh, from then on, she was doing very well. From then on, every hit, you know, the, not every hit was exactly upward, but the general trajectory was upward. Right. So she, Smokey Robinson wrote for I mean, uh, Holland, Dozier Holland wrote for her. They did pretty well. Then she, at the company, she got together with Smokey Robinson, who was, they, they made a great team. He wrote her big hits, My Guy, right. uh, Two Lovers. They were incredible hits. They made millions of dollars. Uh, so then at age 
this is all before she was 21. I mean, most people before they're 21, I, I was, just <laughs> wandering around trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. At 21, she was a big success. She toured Europe with the Beatles. Uh, she was the Motown representative, selected to tour right. with them. Uh, and then she, then she made her big mistake. She she got a swelled head. She, but I would have too, to be honest. And lots of people would because she'd done all this for Motown, you know. She uh, she put Motown on the map, so right. to speak. And they they were always boasting about how they did artist development, you know, where they train the artists how to get up on a piano, uh, you know, how to. Uh, beat the Queen of England and stuff, but all that's true, and also, more relevantly, how to organize their acts, so the backgrounds, background people do it well behind, you know, the whole thing. Uh, she didn't need any of that. She started out with a hit, and then just went up from there. So she made the big mistake of quitting Motown. And, okay, uh, so uh, let, me, let me stop you right there. She did, so it is the fact of a big head she just quit there was no discrepancy that she uh noticed or, or or thought was going on or any any conflict between the the her and the paperwork or, or barry gordy that gave her the inclination that this is not a right place for me none of that she she, she thought there was okay but i i did a lot of research in the records there may have been but there's no proof okay uh, and in fact, when she left, uh, Gordy really wanted her to stay. She was their only female star, only female solo superstar. Uh, she was bringing in all the big records. Right. So he he wanted her to stay, and and uh, he offered her half the company. Wow. That is an interest in half the company to lead to stay, uh, which she refused. She said she could do better on her own. It was youthful uh, uh, arrogance. Right, 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 so, right, right. So, right, right, and even when he left, he gave her, he gave her what I believe she was owed, which was I believe two hundred fifty thousand dollars for her, uh, which she then used. But she actually blew a lot of it on limousines, high living. She rented a big apartment on Park Avenue. Moved oh, to wow. New York, rented a okay. Park Avenue apartment. Uh, she didn't. She didn't do anything spectacularly bad. It's just that from then on, uh, she had to fight her way up the charts again, and right. never made it as far as she did. Uh, also, now, I, oh, go ahead, please. What I, what I wanted to ask. I can talk you, forever. So no, that's okay. No, 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 no. It's fine. Uh, I, the, the reason why I stopped because I wanted to be clear or make clear for the audience when she left and as she left, Barry Gordy apparently and obviously offered her some really, really unusual benefits to stay. So that show, that says a lot. So when she decided not to take it and to walk away, was she under the same uh, strict situation where her name was theirs or something like this? No, they couldn't. You know, her name was so well known, unlike Florence, she didn't have a name problem. Because right. Barry Wells was such a household name by then. Right. Uh, it was all over the radio, uh, all over TV. She, she was well known. So they couldn't take her name away because it was a real name. Right, uh, she broke barriers. <laughs> right. Uh, so there was nothing they could do to her, really. They, honestly, I felt bad for Gordy. Uh, he felt, I mean, he, he thought he was getting shafted. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, the Supremes weren't doing anything. Uh, At that, that time. Is, right, 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 they, right. They were a group, but they weren't doing that well. Amazingly enough, uh, Mary was supposed to do Where Did Our Love Go? Baby, mm. baby, where did our... Yeah. That was scheduled to be her song. But then when she left, they had, they were forced to give it to the Supremes. Wow. So, and then the Supremes, that was the first of their ten, number one, 10 number one hits in a row. Wow. That, uh, so all that would have been Mary Wells if yeah, she stayed, those yeah. ten hits. Wow. So, you know, it, before we move on, I, I want to discuss based on your uh, uh, information and recollection, her, Mary Wells, that is, upbringing, right? Because these decisions come from somewhere. And we know that, you know, after a while, she got caught up in a whole bunch of things. What was her early days prior to Motown like? Uh, or did you even get into that part? Oh, I did, yeah, absolutely, yes. One of her real problems was she was very sick. Uh, she was a sick young lady. I don't mean mentally ill, uh, but she had various uh, 
I think tuberculosis and uh, several other serious diseases and spent a lot of time in the hospital. So, and she recovered amazingly. A lot of people, well, I don't know, some people would have uh, been defeated by having so right. many serious diseases as a young person. But she didn't. She, you know, she finished high school. She didn't uh, drop out. She didn't become a drug addict. Uh, the only thing she did was take up smoking. Uh, she smoked, right. smoked three packs of nicotine a day starting at age 15 or so. That's hard, especially to keep that great voice. So, right. so now, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, tuberculosis and some of the other uh, uh, ailments she got was based on her impoverished beginning, right? Because they were in a very poor, very poor situation. Yes, that's true. Right. So, so no, I'm, I'm asking based on could could these early beginnings be some of the the uh, 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 I don't say focal points, but but grounds to some of the decisions she was making. Yes. Well, also I think so, but also there's youth. I mean. Uh, right. Suddenly you're vaulted, it, both with Flo and Mary, they were vaulted from, uh, you know, a single, living with a single mom, well, not in Flo's case, but in Mary, they had a single mom, uh, there were several kids to support, they didn't have much money, you know, everything, that Mary was sick all the time, it was dreary, dreary, right. uh, and suddenly she's a world-class star touring Europe and Asia before she's 21, right. it would have screwed up anyone's decision making. And she, you know, she might have been right. We have the benefit of hindsight, of course. She, right. she might have been able to do even better after Motown. Uh, well, it, I'm, I'm happy you brought that up because now, if I'm not mistaken, because of her success and her success pretty much uh, mapping Motown as the go-to of, of this new black music that's crossing over, she is funding the entire, the, what she's doing, her music, her work is funding their entire movement, right? Yes, that's true. That's why Gordy wanted her to stay, because he was making tons of money off her. Uh, <laughs> See, th there we go. <laughs> he wanted her to stay, Brooklyn, did you listen, did, uh, he wanted her to stay because he was making tons of money off of her. That's an interesting statement, because it, it he didn't want her to stay so that they could build this company together. He was desperate in that attempt to give her half. Well, that was that was Motown's, another one of Motown's tricks. Uh, they charged the artists for the expenses of recording. Right. Uh, now, it wasn't Gordy's unique idea. The white That's the business. Yeah, the white record companies at the time did it also. Uh, so, you even if you, the artist, had a hit record, it was very difficult to make any substantial amount of money because you had to pay for all the musicians right. who were unionized uh, and uh, sat there hour after hour at large hourly rates doing it. You had to pay for the uh, your expenses touring around, which are tremendous, you know, armies of handlers and accountants. You right. had to pay for everything, basically. Right. Out of, your, out of the royalties, which at the beginning, which were only a low percentage of the part of the cost, of the retail cost of the record, anyway. So, you you were basically screwed uh, at Motown, whoever you were, right, uh, or where, where, wherever you were, for that matter. In most situations, yes, right. So, I, just to be clear to the audience, this is not a bashing Barry Gordy moment, right, or Motown for that matter. Um, he, yes, and that, let me just add that he claims, I think correctly, and certainly the Supremes case that the Supremes would have gone nowhere uh, without him. Because uh, he tr brought, he got them together, he trained them, he kept them going through 10, at least 10 records that didn't make any money for anybody. Right. Uh, no one else, a white record company or any, uh, any other black record company would have just told them that after the third record didn't hit the top 20, just take a hike. Right. You know, we, we got other things to do. But, right. but he, had, he had the vision to keep them going. But then he took their money. <laughs> all legally. All well, okay, so if it was legal, you know, well, okay, you know, now we we're on to, uh, first of all, what uh, interesting, whether it's connection or, or, or um, if it, you know, connection or something that shocked you 
doing all this history on, on, on Motown because, you, you know, the initial book is about the entire record label and legacy. Then now we have the two that breaks it into specific stories. So that's a lot of Motown research you did. Yes, that's true. So so what 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 is there, what stories or anything that, that was unique or like, wow, really shocked you out of their story? Well, the financial stuff that we're talking about, right. that was a, a revelation to me. I mean, it's not like I was walking around thinking, oh, I wonder how record companies work. You know, right. first I read the person, then I thought, well, why is she so poor, you know? Then, I, then you have to go into it. A lot of it involved uh, going through court cases. Mm. Uh, Flo sued uh, Motown, Mary Wells sued Motown. Almost every artist that was there in the 60s eventually sued them. Wow. Luckily, under the Constitution, which I hope we have for a few more days, uh, <laughs> the uh, court records are preserved and are available to the public. You just have to go in there. The old days, well, now you can see them a lot online. Right. But in the old days in Detroit, I spent a lot of time in the basement of the courthouse mm. uh, going through the whole, all the records, just seeing what the hell was happening. It, I like that stuff because I'm a, just like you. I'm a scholarly type. Uh, <laughs> I sit around and look at this stuff, and you know, oh, after page 950, well, there's the answer. There right, it is. Right, right, right. That's what those I've been trying to keep from me. <laughs> so uh, that's that investigative journalism. Yeah, exactly right. Yes. If you if you don't like going through uh, piles of papers, then you you should be in something else. Absolutely. I mean, football. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, acting. they go through piles of papers. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Uh, <laughs> But anything else. So anyway, that that uh, the financial stuff really got me. And uh, you know, a super freak. The next book, he was a Motown star. Too. He was. That was my next question. You really like Motown stars? Well, that's the other thing. One of the things I realized was uh, the bo this book, the story of Motown, took me a long time and was very difficult for me because I knew nothing. Uh, about Motown. Well, so I had to what what kind it. of music did you listen to? Were you even into black music at this oh, time? Oh, no, I was happened? a Motown fan, a really big one. Uh, I got in several auto accidents in Detroit mm. because luckily I didn't kill anyone. Uh, oh. <laughs> several auto, they're fender benders. Uh, because the new song from Motown would come on, I'd go, what the hell is this? Where did this come from? This is a new kind of music, as you were saying. Right. It's it's uh, very historical because it was a combination of white and black music. Right. Uh, right. The, the uh, I mean, in the fifties, you know, in uh, Peggy Lee's song, I think it was her. The number one song in the fifties was "How Much Is That Doggy in the Window." Can you think of a more wimpy song? Than right. That? Right. Uh, <laughs> then. Uh, that was where white music was, you know. Uh, and uh, Bill Haley, Bill Haley was the first white guy to pick up on black stuff. And are we talking Bill Haley, uh, DJ, or no? Bill artist? Haley in the comments. Uh, he was a musician. Okay, because I thought wasn't it um, was it Pat? Who was the guy doing all oh, the Richard, Pro Richard, little Richard right. songs? Yes, a lot of a lot of white. Pat Boone was a, a great case. In fact. You know, that'd be a good book idea, although I'm sure Pat's been done, but he uh, he tried to whiteify black music. If he I, sure did. Uh, he'd, uh, and to this day says that he, his intention was to do the black culture a favor to uh, introduce black music to the white audience. Yeah, I guess. This, this is what he said. <laughs> Except he sort of whippified the songs. He, 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 didn't, he didn't do them the same way. He'd just do... I, I can't remember what the good ones were, uh, you know. Uh, there was there were some funny ones where he changed the words because he thought they'd offend mom and dad at home. But uh, there were a lot of people. They get they had to get ideas from white from black people because the white idea people weren't producing anything good anymore. But then they they'd sing it in a kind of weird what I thought was a wimpy way. <laughs> Instead because rhythm was bad, you know, right. even implying sex was bad. Uh, Got you. So, so all right. Okay. But then cuz that was my, my next question yeah. in terms of what did you mean by wimpy? Uh, cuz I was thinking more in terms of delivery and passion, but you mean just the 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 Actually, uh, passion is a good word to use yeah. with the wimpy. Because all, all of those things that are considered carnal was removed. Yes, and also the rhythm was a big thing. Uh, okay. You know, uh, even it was even too much for some people. Uh, Motown used tambourines on records. Right. It was 
you couldn't, I mean, you could hear them, but they weren't, they didn't dominate the records. But in the back end, you'd hear a nice tambourine on right. the beat. I love that stuff. When uh, Gordy uh, took the Motown company, or took Motown's records to England, a lot of the DJs objected, the English DJs. They didn't, they didn't think people would listen to records that had tambourines on them. Wow. That's what the 50s and 60s were like. Not for any racist reason, it was just... It was weird, too weird for them. You know, so it's, it's funny, it, you know, because he, <laughs> right after this time of him introducing it, and then some of the the the, the, the European uh, kids and soon to be musicians listening to the Howling Wolves and and folk like this. Now you have the '60s movement with every white band coming from Europe. With a tambourine in there. Oh yes, but that was that was like after though. That was a counter invasion. Yes, that's right. <laughs> no, no, uh, you couldn't in England. You couldn't buy. Liverpool was the where the Beatles are from. Was right. The center of this because the record companies of the U.S. and England didn't think English people, who at the time were mostly white, would would buy any black records. But these sailors on English ships would land in the port of Liverpool, in New York or where else, wherever they landed in America, they'd buy black records. Then they'd bring them back and play them. People would have the same reaction I did. What the hell is that? Right, where did right, that come right. from? And then, like the Beatles had exactly that reaction. And they'd try to imitate the records. You know, uh, which is obviously very flattering, I think, unless you steal them, which they didn't. Uh, the Beatles didn't. Other people did. Uh, you know, that's an interesting thing because a lot of the early black musicians had a, had a bad time early on because they'd sign up with companies that were black or white, and the usual thing they'd do, they were much worse than Gordy, they'd say, okay, uh, whoever you are, uh, that's a good song, I want you to sing it, I'll give you $500. And, right. And, uh, that would be it. Uh, they didn't get any royalties. Right, so. right. They just sold it. They got right. an upfront five hundred dollars, and that was it. Um, so let's talk about Super Freak real right. quick before we wrap. Um, okay. And the life of James Brown. I mean James Richard. Rick James. I'm sorry. He's James not too Brown far. Close, so. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. We're talking about. I don't even want to talk about the bad stuff. I want to remember his music. So let's talk about. Right. <laughs> well, I say bad stuff to to be wimpy. I was a, a Rick James fanatic as a kid, so because. Uh, I mean, who didn't want a very freaky girl that you cannot bring home to mama? That's exactly right. I have the same reaction. By the way, that video is great. It's worth looking at again. Yeah, it's a super freak video. Uh -huh. I, I, I can go as far as saying that a lot of rock bands, as uh, music videos became prominent, took from that music video. Yes. Well, he was very influential. He's, he's supposedly, and I, I believe it, the precursor of rap music. And hip hop. Yeah, he, he's uh, on that fine line. Anyway. He's on that fine line. It, it, it was there. He, he he incorporated. Like I mean, he was just brilliant. What 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 inspired you to speak about Brother Rick? Well, what I was going to say very quickly is that it's easier to write books about Motown Record Company after you've written the first one. They get progressively easier because you don't have to do the basic research. You can right. just go ahead and do what Rick, how Rick was different than the others. You already know about the earlier ones. Uh, and Rick was the most daring of the Motown artists. He brought them into uh, a musical region where you could talk directly about sex yeah. uh, and use a lot of rhythm and a lot of uh, references to drugs and uh, Room 714 and you know, there are yeah. endless references. Mary Jane. Uh, Mary Jane, yes. Mm -hmm, and there's mm -hmm. a church of Mary Jane, by the way, in Indianapolis now. Wow. Uh, which uses his uses that song as a uh, hymn. Wow, uh, unbelievable. Anyway, so he he finally advanced them. This is much different. You don't know, prost you're not as old as I am. Obviously, you don't realize how much this, these things have changed. You couldn't mention drugs. You'd be pro the FBI would arrest you. You know. Right. Uh, now he's talking. He's he's uh, singing a song in praise of marijuana. That's right. And then That's right. Uh, cocaine and everything else. It was. He was very interesting. He was from a much uh, lower economic level and, and educational level than the early Motown people, but he really fought his way up, uh, almost li well, literally in some cases. Right. Got the money together, uh, moved to Canada to avoid uh, being arrested for, uh, which he was eventually, for deserting the Navy. Uh, he had a very rough life, and he was very commendable in that he fought back and made himself a success by coming up with a new, a new angle on on the. Union of black and white music, and I, I think his songs are great. 
Uh, that was the, he was the last of the Motown superstars, except for Lionel Richie, who right. uh, was sort of a sort of retro. I mean, he, he went back to rom clean romance and balladeering. Yeah, yeah. L Lionel Richie was was, and that, that's the conversation that I have with my brother a lot. That one of the main reasons why um, the group. Well, he left the group is because they were a funk band, and Lionel Richie wanted to write ballads. Yes, because he, he's a composition dude. He's really, he likes to get down and dirty. I didn't realize how many, how many um, instruments this guy played. So now, as we wrap up, any last words? Where could the people find your book? Well, they're all they're all available on Amazon. Uh, dot com. Uh, Super Freak, Mary Wells, Lost Supreme. You can buy them easily on Amazon. The story of Motown uh, is a rare book now because it was so successful and, and uh, came out so long ago. There it is. <laughs> uh, it's moving around here. Uh, it's going to be republished in uh, 19 next year, oh, uh, wow. 2018, because Motown's 60th anniversary is coming up in 2019. That's and, right. and Motown is also putting out a TV series called the story of Motown that just like this very book interesting. so this is going to be a movie tie-in whether they like it or not <laughs> uh, did you get to see the Motown the stage play yes yes did I you was, enjoy it yes I thought it was great yeah uh, I recommend it it's still on tour it's been on tour for at least two years yeah a hit on Broadway then it made a national tour Gordy did a good job I hope he thinks I did a good job but Nevertheless, there it is. All right. <laughs> and I, I saw the play. It was great. Um, so I want to thank you for joining us on Jack Dapper Blues Heritage Podcast. It was great talking to you about not just, well, we didn't really speak about the legacy of Motown, but the, the specific stories of a, a, a couple of great ladies and a, a great gentleman who come out of the Motown family and, and, and your perspective, well, not even just your perspective, your investigative journalism. On, on what I like to call African American tribal music and the black experience. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes. Brother Brooklyn, what's going on, man? Thing is good, man. That's a great, great interview. Great interview. Well, Any thanks last very questions? Much. No. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we're going to sign out until the next time. Remember, when you come here, you're going to learn them blues, the rhythm and blues. You want the field hollers because Motown was big with field hollers. They just niced it up for for another audience. But if you listen to a lot of those cats and sisters, there was some field hollering in there. All right, check out these books. Educate yourself about your history, your heritage, and your music. We'll see y'all next time.